Amen. Revelation chapter 22 and uh, verse number one. I'll read four verses down through verse number four. Amen. Man, what a great crowd. And this is the first night of camp meeting. I, I don't know what you're going to do with everybody on Friday night. So just, I don't know, put them outside, stack them up. I don't know. Amen. Praise God. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number one, he shoot me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall no more, there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and they shall see his face. He didn't say, and they shall see their face, They shall see his face. Mm. In his name, those that see his face, his name will be on their foreheads. Praise God. I want to preach tonight about the fire and the river. The fire and the river. Amen. Brother Bounds, where are you at? Come, come up here and sit over here by the bishop and them because I'm going to pick on you a little bit tonight. I'm going to pay you back. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I love you, Jesus. I'm thankful for this opportunity to minister before your people. I pray you help us tonight. Let my mind be clear, my spirit be clear. Let me say what you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Mm. And I ask that you confirm your word with science following and exercise authority in this service in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're being seated, turn to somebody next to you and say, are you on fire? If you're not on fire, just come to California. <laughs> we got plenty of it right now. Amen. Amen. I have given a lot of my ministry preaching about a vision that God gave me many years ago. I was pastoring in the great state of Oklahoma. I took a church, I'd come off the evangelistic field, and I was full of all kinds of ideas. And uh, nobody warned me about church-run or board-run churches. And I know we have to have boards, and there's board members that are great men of God I'm sure that's what all of Ohio is about. Hmm. But uh, I inherited two boards, a trustee board and a church board. I had siblings that served on both sides. And one of my first board meetings, they were all about to come to blows, literally. And... Uh, I figured I wasn't called here to pastor, I was called here to referee. <laughs> it was quite a, quite a deal. And uh, nobody told me about churches that were family owned and operated. Kind of like, we own that pew. 
I got a phone call. They were having music practice. I got a phone call, and they told me that uh, the church organ had a little cover that came down over it. had been padlocked. <laughs> I'm 26 years old, and I had a quick trigger finger. I'm not a good pastor. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, I'm not a good pastor. I, I lack compassion a lot of times. And, uh, <laughs> and I have a hard time tolerating people that ought to be acting older. And uh, <laughs> anyway. I called the lady that padlocked it. I said, did you padlock the organ? Yes, I did. And why? Because I don't want anybody else playing it. That's my organ. <laughs> I said, did you pay for it? Nope. I'm the one that plays it and it's mine. And I'll give permission and you can't let anybody else play it unless you get permission from me. And uh, needless to say, I did not manifest much the nature of Christ. <laughs> I informed her that I had a hammer. A true story. And that I was headed down to the church. And I was going to bust that padlock right off that organ. She informed me that I couldn't do that. And I informed her that I'm going to. And she said, I'm telling you, you can't do it. I'm the one that plays it. I said, nope, that's your second mistake. You used to play it. I don't need that kind of stuff up there trying to lead worship. Now, I know these are Oklahoma problems. And um, so, but man, we just... I just full of ideas about revival and how revival ought to take place. And so I, uh, man, we just kept hitting the wall. So I was asked to preach in a church in the Little Rock area, and I had taken one of the men from the church with me, and we got over there. And I told him, I said, uh, look, I need to spend a little time in prayer. And if you don't mind, uh, <clears throat> wow, if you don't mind, uh, there's a nice mall down the road, some good restaurants and and uh, you can take the car and go down there. I'm going to pray a little while. He said, oh, no, Brother Morgan, if you're going to pray, I'm going to pray with you. And, uh, you know, I don't mind community prayer. I think it's necessary. I think it's a part of it. But sometimes I like to pray alone. And uh, so we prayed a little bit. And it's just, you ever had one of those prayer meetings where you felt like it was just flat? Anybody? I guess the rest of you, every time you pray, the heavens open and angels are ascending and descending and you're floating in the air. But <coughs> uh, no, it just, we just hit it and we prayed a while. I did everything they taught me in prayer. I did the prayer walk, the prayer talk, the prayer wheel. <laughs> I got down between my bed and the motel wall there and I had pillows propping me up and I was, down there trying to, and it just, so we got up after a while and I told the guy, I said, look, there's a nice mall and there's some restaurants down the road and if you want to go down there, I'm going to pray a little while longer. And, um, man, he said, no, I'm going to stay with you. And I had just barely turned the little walkway in the motel room, this chair he was standing in front of and, uh, just as I turned, I'm going to weird out on you here a second, all right? So just as I turned, I heard this wind blow, just, you know. And the next thing I knew, I was, um, I was not in that motel room. It's like I was in some elevated place and out and... All of a sudden, in my peripheral view, I turn to look, and there's this twirling, massive ball of fire. <clears throat> I watched it as it broke into 
the earth's hemisphere, and as it did, it splintered. And uh, just like these balls of fire shooting across the globe. <clears throat> I watched the main one, and I watched it come over the state of Oklahoma, over the little community I was pastoring in called Oak Mulgee. Then I seen it above our church building. And then the next thing I know, I could see inside the sanctuary. Now, all of you that believe in uh, latter-day outpouring, you also have to believe in dreams and visions. You can't choose which one of those. And so... When that ball of fire hit in front of the pulpit, and for years it intrigued me that it didn't hit in the pulpit, but it hit in front of the pulpit, and when it did, out of it came thousands of angels with swords drawn. And I heard the word of the Lord say this, the darkness will not prevail against the light. Nope. Something happened in the spirit. The church is a supernatural entity. You cannot take the supernatural out of the church and it remain the church. There was another time, same thing, except this time when it, I was preaching a conference in Colorado and it was like tonight, man, the worship was fervent and I heard that wind blow again and I seen that ball of fire, but this time when it hit, it was not angels that came out of it, but it was young men with Bibles in their hands. They were bent in forward motion. The Lord said, this is how I will set America on fire. I will ignite local churches with this fire, and coming out of it will be fiery evangelists. And everything they touch that is combustible is going to burn. Praise God. You better read your Bible because there's a lot about fire. The second act of God's judgment against the world is going to be with fire. So I don't say this just casually, but I say it this way. You can burn now or you can burn later. But everybody is going to burn. So I choose to let the Holy Ghost and fire into my life now to consume out of me because our God is a consuming fire. He said, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He meant, I will send my fire into your life to consume the chaff and to remove everything that's not like me. So that's the whole purpose of this fire is for it to come and consume. Our God is a consuming fire. There's other parts of this I'll leave off and I have preached around the globe. I have preached to the United States. I have preached that and preached it and preached it and preached it. And uh, we are believing God for that. We really are. And uh, I, I, I've given my life to that. But a few months ago, <clears throat> Uh, someone called and said, uh, I, I, I feel to tell you something. And so they began to talk to me. And it showed me a different aspect. Uh, when you look at the fire, it is, our God is a consuming fire. The fire of God does not just fall for just some display. But you will always find the fire of God coming to the altar. But for it to come to the altar, there's got to be a sacrifice on the altar. Praise God. So, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, I was privileged to preach for Brother Bounds and uh, we had tons of interpretation that night. And the interpretation was, my fire is reserved in the heavens. My fire is above the city. The only thing my fire seeks is an altar. If you will build me the altar, my fire will fall. Praise God. Stay with me now. 
Now, I understand when we start talking about the altar among us apostolics, we associate the altar with prayer. Uh, a few years ago, I seen, uh, in, in a dream, I seen some young men standing in front of the platform and they were dancing and rejoicing. And I said, what are you excited about? And their reply was, we have removed the altar out of this church. And I knew well, that's nothing to rejoice about. And uh, I want to tell you that you can pray but not have an altar. The altar is not about prayer. The altar is about death. It's where something dies. Mm. So if you don't have an altar in your life and you're praying, I can assure you that you are praying amiss. Because you're not praying God's will, you're praying your own will. But you show me that somebody that's got an altar and they are living that crucified life, I'll show you somebody when they start to pray that prayer will be in alignment with the will of God and it is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. He's in right standing with God. That availeth much. Oh, praise God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I, I want to tell you, the Apostle Paul was very clear about this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't anybody ever lie to you and tell you that holiness is not reasonable. It's your reasonable service. What he's saying there is, is your worship. This is true worship. True worship is not you lifting your hands and speaking and jumping or whatever. But true worship to God is when you are living that kind of a life where you are a living sacrifice. Living is continual and perpetual. I asked Dr. Hughes one time, I said, what, what about that verse? What about living sacrifice? He said, well, that's pretty simple, really. He said, uh, in the Old Testament, you know, uh, they put a sacrifice on the altar, you killed it, it didn't crawl off. He said, but you and I both know you can get on the altar today, but tomorrow you can crawl right off the altar. And he said, so it's about perpetually living that kind of a life. This is what God is asking us for. I travel all across the United States and I constantly have people come up and this is what they say. Uh, do you have a word for me? What's the will of God for my life? And uh, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I realize that some of these people are sincere, and if God tells me something, I don't mind telling people. But uh, I've learned to realize that apostolics are kind of spiritually lazy. And you don't want to pray, you want me to pray for you. And you don't want to go to the throne to find the will of God, you want me to go for you. Boy, I lost a bunch of you right there, amen. I had a young man one time came up to me the first night of a meeting and he said, Lord spoke to me that uh, this, this, and this, and then while you were here, you would fill in the blanks basically. And I said, okay. So that was first night. Second night, he come up after service, said, do you have that word for me? I said, I don't. Come up the third night, last night, he said, you got that word for me? I said, I don't. I could tell he's a little irritated. <clears throat> like, what's wrong with you, Brother Morgan? Are you carnal? And... Uh, so he, he expressed his irritation, and I said, you know something, son, there's something I don't understand about this. He said, what's that? I said, God told you all that other stuff. Why didn't you let him fill in the blanks? I want to help somebody. You better be really careful when somebody else is telling you what they think the will of God is for your life. I've learned that through experience, too. The best way for you to find the will of God is to do exactly what Paul said. 
Just become a living sacrifice. You will never know what the will of God is until you get to the altar because it's at the altar that your will has got to die. What you want has got to die. I feel like preaching here a second. This is the struggle that we're having. I've said through the years, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. Jesus Christ died in the garden. He died when he made this statement. Not my will. Not my will, <clears throat> but thy will be done. You're not dead until you can pray that kind of a prayer. You're living life the way you think you ought to live it. You've learned the mechanics of church. You've learned how to do this. But I'm telling you, if there was ever a time that the apostolics needed to get to the altar and for us to die out on how we think God ought to be running his business, it's right now. Revival and harvest is not going to come the way you think it's going to come. This harvest is going to be led by the Holy Ghost. And those that will go to the altar and be not conformed to this world, but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. The only way your mind will ever be renewed is when you get to the altar and you put your mind and you put your ways and you put your will on the altar and you say, there it is, God. Now I'm asking you to consume it. And when it's consumed, I'm expecting for something to be better on that altar and for me to know. For me to know what is the will of God. That I can prove what is the will of God. Well, praise God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you better be careful. You better be careful because you can get to telling God what you think. And uh, you, can, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. Boy, it's quiet right now. Did you know that all of us in this building have the propensity to be Satan? I didn't say, I didn't call you a devil. Satan just means adversary. Simon is, uh, boy, I can meddle right now, Bishop. Simon is the, ark, the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood it not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. If you read five verses down, going into the sixth verse, guess what Jesus says to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Just think, all it takes to fall from blessed to Satan is five verses. And you know why Jesus called him Satan, adversary? Because Jesus expressed the will of God. I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And Simon Peter said, oh no, that ain't going to happen. Bless God. I got a sword. We're going to protect you. We're going to defend you. You're going to the throne of your father, David. You're going to resurrect an army. You're going to drive Rome back into the sea and you're going to restore Israel back to its preeminence. That's not what I said. I said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And the moment that had of his own understanding and what he perceived to be the will of God and he speaks against the will of God, he has now become Satan. Mm. Better be careful when you're trying to figure it all out in your intellect and that little analytical brain of yours. And when the word of God comes forth and vision comes forth and the will of God is expressed and it doesn't fit your paradigm and it doesn't fit the way you want to do it, you better be careful what's about to come out of your mouth. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be preaching positive here tonight. Now's not the time for us to get off on our own stuff and to start doing our own will and doing our own thing. Now's the time for the apostolics to get to the altar and for us to die out and say, we need a visitation of the fire of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Somebody clap your hands here a second. Mm. Everybody said amen. Everybody good? Anybody mad and want a refund? <laughs> now, I've preached a lot about that fire. A lot about it. And I am convinced 
that we're going to see it. I'm going to say it again. I am convinced that we're going to see it. Everybody here ought to be thinking right now, I want my city and my community set on fire with the Holy Ghost. And if the church will build an altar and we'll put ourselves on it and the fire of God will consume us, when we go out there, something's going to happen. Woo. I think y'all are kind of connecting right now. Yeah. Everybody say the fire. fire. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I am. Uh, I get that. I understand that. So I started kind of doing a little study. And uh, during COVID especially, I felt like the Lord was directing me personally. You need to understand the difference between the church and the kingdom. My people understand the culture of the church, but they do not really understand the kingdom. Now, without getting into a big theological debate, and you have to call for a special board meeting to straighten all this out. Let me put it to you like this. I see the church as the queen. I see him as the king. That's the way I see it. The church is feminine. The feminine's responsibility is to nurture. The king's responsibility, the masculine responsibility, is authority. Provide, correct. That's his responsibility. It is not the church's responsibility to operate in the masculine. We teach against that. That went right over your heads, amen. God never intended for us to have a transgender even in the church. When you start dealing with transgender, you have to understand that you are touching Christ and the church because Jesus Christ is the last Adam and the church is the last Eve. So now we see Adam and Eve. We see it in the church and Christ. So when people try to change all of that, you're trying to change more than what you think. It doesn't matter what you try to change when it's all said and done. The only thing that's going to be left is him and his bride. Amen. I know some of you get nervous. Man, get off that. Man, if you think that's bad, you ought to pastor in San Francisco. So you, you, you see all this, but the kingdom, the kingdom. So I spent a lot of time looking at the kingdom, the approach of the kingdom, how the kingdom operates. If you'll remember when Jesus called the 12, the 70, he told them, he said, I want to send you out in uh, groups of two. I want you to preach, repent, for the kingdom is nigh. And so... Well, why did you send them out like that? Well, you go, this is what you do. You cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. You heal the sick. This is what he was telling them. If you get there and there is a son of peace there, then my peace will remain. But if it's not, then uh, let the peace return back to you and you just dust dirt off of that city, off of yourself and go on down the road it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the end time than that city. So I got to looking at all that, trying to figure that out. What in the world does that mean? And then I realized that any time an advancing king or kingdom was about to go to another city, they would send messengers or harbingers into the city, and they would ask that city, do you want us to come in peace, or do you want us to come in war and judgment? If they want peace, then the peace of the approaching kingdom would remain there. So Jesus was giving us an example that my kingdom should be advancing. 
I'm sending you out into the world. The church is where we gather together to be nurtured, but I'm sending you into the world as kingdom messengers. And if they want it, then my peace will remain. They'll make me their king. They will confess me as Lord. But if they don't, then it's pretty clear what's about to happen. So I got to looking at all that. And then I realized that in every kingdom, there's a king and there's a throne. And the throne is the seat of his government. It's where he rules from. That's why the wise men said, where the word of a king is, there's power. And who can question it? In other words, once a king decrees something, you don't have the right. See, it's not a republic or a democracy where you got a right to your opinion. And everybody can say whatever it is they want to say. That might work here in the good old United States of America, but it doesn't work where there's kings. Kings don't come and ask you, what do you think? They don't put it out there and say, you judge it and do you want this and all. They just say it. And the wise men said, who can question it? Whether you agree or you disagree, it's the word of a king. And it's always right. And so this is the throne now become extremely important to me. Now, <clears throat> I, I got to looking at the throne and how do we approach the throne? And uh, <clears throat> then I got to looking at Genesis and the garden and all the stuff and all. Now, <clears throat> without getting into a debate here tonight or trying to prove something, I don't have time. I am convinced that Eden was a perfect type of God's throne. It's where he ruled and reigned, as far as we know, in the earth. I also believe that this is where Satan, Lucifer as we would know him there, I believe it was Lucifer's responsibility as the angel that was to cover, to protect. I believe it was his responsibility to protect and to guard the throne of God, the reign of God in that place called Eden. Now, this is my own personal understanding of it. I also know that when he refused to guard the throne of God or the will of God, then uh, he is no longer Lucifer, but now he has become Satan or the devil. And it's a process. So I think it's important for us to recognize that the throne of God is extremely important because this is where he rules and this is where he reigns. This is where his will is expressed. And so if you ever get to the throne and you ever establish that throne of God in your life, you better guard it with everything that is within you. Are you listening to me here tonight? You need to guard it with everything that's within you. If God has spoken to you and given you his will, you need to guard it and to protect it. Don't let anybody question it. Don't listen to any voice that tries to plant confusion or chaos to speak against it. I don't care who it is. Once God has spoken to you and once God has decreed it and you got it from the throne, you better learn how to protect it and not let anything take. If you're honest enough here tonight, you'll, you'll admit it. Once God speaks to you about something, decrees his will to you, from that point on, as far as I'm concerned, all hell breaks loose trying to get you off to this way and that way and question everything and get you to back up and get you to move over here and get you to leave and go over here and do that. I, I, I can't operate that away. I told somebody here a while back, I said, I can't keep up with you. You're like a bouncing ball to me. One minute God says this and then tomorrow he changes his mind and it's this. I said, I don't see God doing that. God's not schizophrenic. I said, I operate when God speaks something to me. I'm determined to stay to it until it becomes a reality. I'm not going to let anything question that or get into my mind or let somebody else tell me, well, there's another. Well, there's a perfect will of God and then there's a good will of God and there's an acceptable will of God. You, you may be right, but I just, I just can't go down that path. I think the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. And once I find the will of God, I think he expects me to guard it and to walk in it and to prove it and to execute it. 
That's why the church has got to get to the throne. That's why we need a fresh word from God. That's why God needs to speak in 2022 louder and clearer than he's ever spoke. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I, 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 I know better. I, I'm going to come down here just for one minute. And then when you start shooting at me, I'm going to come back up here. You have to decide. Oh, man, I can see you now. Them lights kind of blind you up there, amen. Feel like Saul on the road of Damascus. Ooh, who art thou, Lord? <laughs> we'll come out here where it's dark. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one either. Mm. Mm -mm. Nope, Mark, don't do it. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying not to be an old man on a soapbox. <laughs> you're trying to get me in trouble is what you're trying to do, buddy. You know, Bishop Starks, if we sing the way God want us to see, even in this service, God's attention and focus would not be up there. It would be out here. So I don't know why we light that up. And you can't even see Look, I'm only preaching one night. Y'all got some great preachers coming in. And the thing the church cannot afford to do is to turn that into performing arts or uh, stage. That's not what it's about. And I don't think you got a problem here, camp. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But I think the attention of God is on his people. And I think five-fold ministry is a gift to his body and not the other way around. Ooh, boy, y'all responded pretty good on that one. All right, sit down. I learned a long time ago with the Keller, there's two thrones. There's a throne of righteousness and there's a throne of iniquity. Now, if y'all let me get to where I'm going to go, we're going to have miracles tonight. And so, what determines what throne rules in the church is the will of the people. When Moses comes down, he reads to the people two or three times, and every time they said, we will hearken and obey. The last time they said it, guess what happens? Moses and the elders, 70 elders, were caught up. They were allowed to see into the heavens, read it, it's in there, and they could see God's throne. But they weren't released to the throne until the people said, we will obey. Iniquity, of course, is lawlessness, not just lawlessness. It's you removing the law and inserting your own. And so every time the man of God preaches in the pulpit, preaches the word of God, and you say, amen, we're going to do it. We're going to obey it. What you're doing is you are establishing a throne of righteousness in that congregation. But when you've got a church full of people that once you preach the will of God, and then they say, I'm not going to do it. There's only one verse in the Bible about it. I've heard that one. What they don't understand is they are removing God's law and they are inserting their own. Therefore, they are establishing within that congregation a throne of iniquity. Ooh, I'm not interested in the throne of iniquity. Now, the preacher can't decide that for you. 
He can tell you what the will of God is. He can preach to you the word of God, but it's up to you to decide. So tonight, we decide what throne is going to be in this service tonight. Do we want him to be enthroned? Do we want there to be a throne of righteousness? Because righteousness means you're now in right standing. And watch what I'm about to tell you. I got to looking at the throne and then it dawned on me that the throne here, but always in the scripture, the altar is in very close proximity to the throne. So it dawned on me that the only way I could get to the throne I had to go by the altar because at the altar I'm getting rid of my will and I'm going over here to the throne to get his will does that make sense praise God yeah yeah so that's why it's extremely important so churches that don't have an altar people that don't have altar the best thing I can say is they become self will self will and so this is uh, something we need to get a hold of. See, Brother uh, Bounds, the fire falls at the altar. But now I'm interested in the throne. I, I get the altar, but the throne. So I got to looking in the scripture, and uh, our text tells you that proceeding out of the throne, is this river of life. <laughs> well, that got me. This river. This river. You preached about this uh, a week or two ago at our Western District Camp meeting. This river. So I got to looking at it and I realized the first place you find that river is Eden. There's a river. It's where God ruled. This is where God reigned in this world. A river. It flowed out of Eden. Once it got out of Eden, it broke into what? Four of the rivers or whatever it is. And so here you go. Then I noticed that that's the first place it's mentioned. The second place that it's mentioned is in the book of Ezekiel. But the river is now coming out of the temple. So I've got Eden where a river proceeds out of. I've got the temple where a river proceeds out of. And I've got the throne where a river proceeds out of. So I started saying it could be they're synonymous. It could be we're talking about the same thing. And wherever that river flows from, that's where I want to find myself. I want to get to the altar, do what I got to do there in order to get to the throne because there's something proceeding out of the throne. Mm. That's why the church has got to build this altar. We've got to put ourselves on it. We've got to get rid of all this stuff. And then we've got to get to the throne of God where the will of God can be established, but there's something that proceeds from the throne. Stay with me now. It proceeds from the throne. Mm. I got to hurry. Now, this river, Ezekiel talked about it. And uh, man, it's interesting. You all know the story? Ankle deep. Was it knee deep? Just thigh up, finally over his head. But where is it proceeding from? It's coming from under the door of the temple. The temple is where God ruled and reigned in the earth. The Ark of the Covenant is basically his throne. Oh, yeah. So it's coming out from under the door of the temple. And as it flows, watch it, as it flows out of the church, it starts getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then it's got great fish and everything it touched except the miry stuff that turned to salt. It brought life to it. Mm. Yeah. See, your city needs life. Your neighbors need life. I'm getting there. Needs life. Needs life. Now, when you get to the throne that I talked about in the book of Revelation, 
There's some key statements there, and I, I want to make sure that I present this right. There's some key statements there. Number one, it's a river of life, clear as crystal. It flows down the street of that city. One translation or one verse talks about that street is made of pure gold. It is purity. So I am convinced that what that river runs on is its channel, its boundaries, is purity. It's where it flows. The Old Testament talks about a highway of holiness. There's nothing unclean there. You got that first of all. And then the next thing you have is you have the revelation of the throne and who's sitting on the throne. Mm. I just can't see how people could ever find a trinity in the scripture. Because really think about it. When you get to Revelation chapter 22, if they are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent, then I would think the other two would have a throne. But I don't see three thrones. I see one throne. I see one sitting upon the throne, and that is the Lamb and God Almighty. They're on that throne. So at the throne, hear me, at the throne is the revelation of the oneness of God. At the throne is the revelation of who the king is. What Paul tells Timothy, the only potentate, the only wise God, the only king, even Jesus Christ. This is what John was seeing in the vision that God was giving him. He was seeing the throne. He's seeing this river proceed out of the throne. And on the side of the river, wherever it flowed, there's this tree and its leaves were the healing of the nations. Oh. And Brother Starks, I thought she was going to preach my sermon. You still come about today at the table. I was like, mm, get off of it, get off of it. Now, what's what happens next? Flows, you got this river, you got the tree, you got healing. And then I told you, You've got these people over here, sees who's on the throne, right? And they got his name in their foreheads, and they're his servants. Now, what in the world do you think happened to you when you took on his name in a covenant called baptism? You bear his name. So you know what I see in that? I see this throne. I see this river. I see this healing. And guess what I see? I see the, the, the climate of it. It's the apostolics. People who know who he is and bear his name. So I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think if anybody ought to have that river flowing, it ought to be the apostolics who has revelation of who he is and we bear his name. I, I, I don't want to belittle or be mean, but I mean, if you got three thrones, which one's that flowing from? Mm. Now, everybody still good? I thought that would excite you. I'm talking about us apostolics. Of course, you got to get to the throne. And once we understand at the throne what's about to happen, I'm telling you, Brother Starks, you're exactly right. There is about to be a flow and a river that begins to move in the world. Listen to me. And wherever that goes, isn't it amazing that Jesus stood on the last great day of the feast and said, if any man thirsts, let him come and drink of me. And I'll give you something that's beyond that, what you're pulling out of a well. Mm. I'm telling you, he was talking about the Spirit. So that river, that river that flows to me is the Holy Ghost. It's the river of life. Nobody sees more people get the baptism of the Holy Ghost than the apostolic church in the world right now. 
My God, they're getting the Holy Ghost by the thousands right now. Why? Because there's a flow of that river. And wherever that river touches, it brings life. My, I feel the help of the Holy Ghost right now. It brings life. But watch this. It doesn't just bring life. It brings healing and the miraculous. So if anybody ought to be seeing people get the Holy Ghost, if anybody ought to be seeing people that get healed or the miraculous, it ought to be people standing at the throne knowing, I know who he is and I bear his name. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. Just make a sense to anybody here tonight. Now, hang on, hang on. Remember, one river coming out of Eden, and then it breaks into rivers, right? So, let me ask you a question. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, and out of your belly? See, you had a river flowing in. But it's rivers flowing out. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. See, out of your belly shall flow a river. Now, it can't flow out of you unless he's enthroned. If he's enthroned in your life and you've built that altar, which I've been preaching a long time about, if you've got all that going, there ought to be something flowing out of you. Rivers of living water and everything that touches I think that's why Jesus said something like this. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Just let it flow. It's kind of locking up for some reason. These signs shall follow them that believe, right? Just say these signs shall follow the celebrities. Or a certain class of apostolic preachers. I realized a long time ago, some people only want you to pray for them so they can go brag about it. See, here's the deal. If you need a drink of living water or you need a miracle, I shouldn't have to lay my hands on you. Somebody on that pew here tonight ought to start saying, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. We're about to have quite a flow of the river of life on this pew. And then it's going to jump from that pew over to that pew. <clears throat> I think we're starting to see something right now. All right, sit down so I can finish it and then it's yours. Literally, I'm going to give it to you here in just a second. Now, Brother Starks. <laughs> How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, I think you can be in unity but not be together. You can all be united for the cause of revival or harvest or whatever, but that don't mean we're together doing it. Unity is just you agreeing with the will of God, basically. Ooh, that went over real well. You know, <laughs> how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the ointment that flowed. But then he says, and it's like the dew that descended Mount Hermon. And there, there God commanded the blessing and life forevermore. See, it settled on Mount Hermon as snow, rain, or dew, normally snow. And as it would melt and descend going down that mountain, it would uh, create a little tributary, a little trickle. And then it would flow down. And then it would connect with another one. Now, you know, you could throw a little rock or a stick or something in front of one of those little trickles and stop it, dam it up. Mm. But if you let another stream, that's the word I'm looking for, 
you let another one flow into it, guess what? You start creating a little more momentum and a little more force. I'll tell you exactly what the psalmist meant. And then it connects with another one. And then it connects with another one. And then it just starts removing all the barriers. And it starts removing all the hindrances. Because that thing is descending. And it's getting stronger all the way down. Until when you get to the base of Mount Hermon, you now have the mouth of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is what brings life to that whole land is the Jordan River. And the psalmist said, it don't start as a river. It starts up there on the top, just a little trickle. But as it connects and as it unifies, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until there's such a flow, you can't stop it. Ooh. Yeah. That is the power of unity. Now, I, I felt a little nudge in my spirit here a while back tonight, and this, I'm gonna say this, and just, just take it. We are very strong against homosexuality and we believe that it is an abomination we do now, I've had people show up and say eating crawfish is an abomination I had them show up and quote that to me all you Christians eating crawfish you're an abomination well there's some differences because crawfish read the scripture it's an abomination to you that's what it says it's an abomination to them but this other is an abomination unto God. And so we're real quick to, it's an abomination. Let me tell you something else that's an abomination. You ready for it? He that soweth discord among the brethren is an abomination. Homosexuality is discord in nature. The others discord in the brotherhood. And it, you're not gonna like this one, it's gonna sting, but it all has the same root system. So you gotta be extremely careful when God is trying to bring something together in unity and you get a little beef or it's not going your way, Burger King, And you're upset. Nobody listened to you. And no, Bishop Stark and I haven't talked. I've been at this long enough, I've been in leadership even long enough to know. Just about the time you think you've got unity. Some self-will person that doesn't have the throne or an altar in their life starts getting crossways with something. If I know what I'm talking about, I don't like the church. I don't like the preacher. I don't like this. And I think they're misspending money. And I think the preacher's blowing it all. And mm. What are we doing with all those offerings we take at camp? Paying me? And I'm high dollar. Expect me to come in here and it'd be cheap. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> now, I'm going to say that and the Lord say, you need to give your offer back to him. <laughs> you, you, you get stuff in your brain. And the next thing you know, you can open your mouth and say something. And so discord. Just because, I don't say it that way. As an evangelist, I always use this illustration. Let, let me go over here. Where's Sister Stark? Where's, where's Sister Stark at? Okay, so here, here's how it works. You got saints in uh, Columbus, what, Calvary? Name it Calvary. And you got saints there, and they start talking. This is what they say. Boy, we take a lot of offerings around here. Mm -hmm. Now, they're at the local McDonald's. 
And it always starts like this. I'm just troubled. <laughs> They'll tear. Now, I'm not gossiping. But I've been praying about this. And I noticed. This is how you destroy faith in a church. Boy, I'm messing this whole service up right now. You know, all those divisions in the Corinthian church, Apollos, Paul, Cephas, and then those that were of Christ. That was the, that was the rough group. They got theirs directly from God. Mm, that went over real well, too. So they're sitting there, tear trickling down their cheek. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying this is actually happening, but it's just appearance, and I'm concerned. But I've noticed that after we take those special offerings, Sister Stark always has a new pair of shoes. <laughs> hey, if you hadn't been approached by people like that, just hang on, they're coming. I'm concerned about the church. I'm concerned about the ministry. I'm concerned about the district. I'm concerned about this. That's, that's, that's where we're at. Now, the next time you come to church and you're trying to worship God, that thought is lodged. And you're like, come on, let's do it. Look, oh my God. I think those are new. I'm just trying to be real with you. And the next thing you know, it starts through the church. They're mishandling the finances. They just blow it all on clothes and stuff and all. And, and, and then you got discord. And it always tries to happen just about the time. A revival or a harvest or a real flow of the Holy Ghost is trying to start. Somebody's going to find something. Normally, they find something to fight about. Man, I've been in evangelists to preach for years, and I've, I've been in churches where they were fighting over some of the most ridiculous stuff. One of them was the color of the carpet. <laughs> Seriously, the color of the carpet. One of them was about the kind of car the preacher was driving. I mean, on and on and on it goes. Now, I'm just going to tell you. Now, you're, you're on the general board. You straighten this out. But it's not just in local churches. It's in our organization. Just about the time we're getting ready to have a harvest, somebody is going to find something to fight about. And, brother, we'll destroy the whole harvest. Woo! I feel, a, I feel a strong word right now. The Old Testament said, if two men are striving and by chance one of them hit a woman that's pregnant and they cause that baby to be born blind or crippled or dead, it is not the mother that determines the punishment. It is the father of the child that determines the punishment. And it's eye for eye, limb for limb, and life for life. You better be careful when your church or district or organization is pregnant with promise and then you and another brother decide you want to find something to fight about and you hit this thing and cause it to be aborted. Let me tell you, it ain't going to be an organization or a local church that's going to determine your punishment. It's going to be the father and the one that the seed of the promise that came from. Put up your sword. I said, put up your sword. You got to decide in life you want to hold a sword in your hand or a sickle. But you can't hold both. Woo. All right, sit down, I'm done. Maybe. Miracles are going to happen here tonight. 
But here as I know miracles are going to happen. I just believe that you guys are going to believe what I'm preaching. Yeah. And this is what I see. I, well, yeah. I see y'all connecting. You ever notice camp meeting, conferences and all? It's just like there's a special anointing there. That's where God commands the blessing. You can't be autonomous. We, we, we struggle with that in the church so much. I'm autonomous. I don't need anybody else. Let me help you with that. You got a little trickle. And you may be saturating a small area. But then all of a sudden a limb falls out of a tree and blocks it. And you're fighting against something that you can't break through. Now you want to stay by yourself now? But then all of a sudden another ministry or another brother or another church gets with you and they start praying with you. And the next thing you know, their flow, your flow connects together. And then all of a sudden it starts creating something stronger. And what maybe one could move, because after all the Bible does say one can put a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, a hundred thousand. What in the world would happen to our world and to our communities if the apostolics ever come together in unity and started letting that flow out, out from the temple, out from the temple? See, your revival is going to start right there on your pew. Your revival is going to start when you alone say, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Woo! And as it flows out into the streets of, where are we at? Columbus and Dayton and Cleveland and where's some other places? Cincinnati, wherever. As it flows out from the door of your church and it starts out into the streets of your city, guess what? This is where you're going to see the miraculous. I'll say it again. This is where you're going to see the miraculous. There's going to be a flow. I see Ohio right now. Yeah, fire's coming. Yeah, it's coming. It's going to burn. But I also see a river that starts to flow. And when it starts into the streets of your city, people will receive the Holy Ghost and people will receive miracles. And it just might be that the Holy Ghost is saying, I want to start that on the first night of your camp meeting. It could happen here so forceful that the state of Ohio will never be the same. And that's not just saying it to hype you up. So, let's put it to practice, what you say. You gonna put it to practice? Okay, now listen, 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 listen. I don't want anybody coming to the front unless we announce otherwise. Okay? Because it's not about a select few coming down here. It's about you connecting. That's it. That's it. And then you connecting. And you connecting. What kind of momentum could we create spiritually if we all just connected tonight? And then all of a sudden... It flowed from you to the person next to you. And they came to the building tonight physically with a need. <laughs> Brother Morgan didn't get a bottle of oil. Nobody gave them a word of knowledge. Nobody called them out and said, you got to honk us or the bonk us or whatever that we say. <laughs> and I'm for all that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. But we wait so much for that to happen. If the body will just learn how to let that flow. What will happen in this building tonight if that happens? I'll tell you what will happen. People will get the Holy Ghost and there will be great healings and miracles in this building tonight. Now, I don't mean this bad, but you don't have to wait to Friday night to get your miracle. It's in you. It's in you. I'm asking God to use every one of you in the gifts of the Spirit tonight. You may not even know you're being used in it, but I'm asking God to let it flow right through you. And while you're praying and worshiping somebody else, the gifts of healing is going to start flowing through you. 
Come on, I need a little help here right now. The gifts of healing start flowing through you. Let a river of life, let a river of healing, let a river of deliverance, let a river of edifying, let it flow in this place tonight. I feel something starting to gurgle just a little bit. Just, just remain standing where you're at. I went down to visit, I'm done. I went down to visit my Aunt Florine when I was about seven or eight years old. I remember two or three things, three especially. Number one, she cooked the best hamburger I've ever eaten in my life. Number two, I needed to go to the restroom. And I was trying to find the door in the house. Aunt Florine, where's your restroom? You go outside. There's a path. You gotta be joking. I hated outhouses then, I hate them now. <laughs> Third thing, she's getting ready to give us some water, was getting ready to eat the hamburgers. And so I went over to the kitchen sink, turned the faucet on. There wasn't no faucet, there's a strange looking contraption and a little spout going this way and had a handle that come this way and then there was a glass of water up in the windowsill and I thought hey I, I, there's water right there so I picked the glass up man Florine said no 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 don't drink that well it's water yeah I know it's water but it's not for consumption I said what what's it for what is it Prime the pump. I said, prime the pump? My dad said, come here, Mark. So I walked over there. He said, put your hand on that handle. And just start pumping that handle. I said, okay. And then he took that water, and he started pouring it down that. And next thing I know, you could hear this. That's kind of what I'm hearing right now in the spirit. I've been trying to prime your pumps for about an hour. And they just kept pouring it in there. And as he kept pouring it in there, it spurted out a little water. He poured some more in there. And I mean, all of a sudden, those seals got moisture and all to get what it's supposed to do. And then this gushing of water came out. I'm telling you, it was good, cold water. So I, I, in the spirit right now, I, I, I hear that gurgle kind of happening. And, and I feel some of you like all of a sudden, something in your faith is kind of being primed just a little bit. <clears throat> I'm asking God to let the gift of faith operate here tonight. Something kind of priming it right now. So here's what we're going to do. You ready? I told you I'm going to give it to you, and this is where I'm going to give it to you right now. You're just going to start praying for each other. Now listen, I don't want you to just pray some little prayer. I want you to get to the throne. And I want you to start praying what the Spirit wants you to pray. We call that praying in the Holy Ghost. And then I want it to start flowing. And I mean, I hope there's not one place in this building that won't be a conduit. I hope there's no blockages here. I pray that it flows from the front to the back and from side to side. Whoo! So we come together in unity. We start connecting in the Spirit. I'm telling you, miracles are going to happen. Just, just mark it down. Miracles are going to happen. Something's about to happen in this building. Something very strong and supernatural is happening. It's already starting right now. Do I have anybody that has faith with me right now? All right. All right. I'm, give, I'm giving it to you. So c connect with somebody. I don't need to connect with nobody. Yeah, 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 I, I, I suggest you do. And I just, I just want you to start praying in the Holy Ghost. I don't mean just for a few seconds. I mean until you feel that flow, that Holy Ghost flow. And it starts saturating every area of this building tonight. Woo! People are delivered and healed. Filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Woo! Somebody came tonight. Somebody came for the Holy Ghost. Come on out of your belly. Out of your belly shall flow a river. Come on, keep praying and just let it get stronger and let it get stronger and let it get stronger. I believe in God for a witness of His Spirit. Ask God to let the gifts of the Spirit flow through you right now to minister effectively to somebody on that pew of yours that you're connected to right now. River of life that flows with healing. A river of life that flows with healing. Yes. 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 No, 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 don't stop. It's just really starting to take off. I'm expecting people to start rejoicing over their miracle. I'm expecting somebody to turn and look at you and say, hey, God just healed me. Yeah, some of you come so discouraged. You're in a battle. I'm telling you, two or three people joining with you may be the thing that you need to push the hindrance out of the way. And for there to be a flow of the Spirit that comes to your area, to your region. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Some of you came with heaviness of heart. Let it flow. That's it, let it flow. That's it, let it flow. That's it, let it flow. Minister to that person. Minister to that person. They're so spiritually parched. Come on, therefore, with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. Let that flow start tonight and continue all week. Jesus' name. Jesus' name.